Good morning, folks. Today is Tuesday, August 2nd. Welcome to episode number 166 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next 30 minutes, but really 45, <laughs> I'll be delivering the top cybersecurity news stories of the day and providing expert analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner so you can operationalize it today, help reduce risk for your organization, or if you're looking to break into the industry, you're absolutely going to dominate it in your interview, I assure you. And if you don't believe me, just ask chat because the Simply Cyber community is strong and many of them have been asked these questions in interviews and just slam dunked it. Shout out and thanks to this stream sponsor, Barricade Cyber Solutions right there. Cyber criminals have stolen your company's data and derailed your business operations. Barricade Cyber Solutions will help you resolve this ransomware attack and get your business back on track. It's good for you as a practitioner because you have support, aid, assistance. It's good for the business side of everybody because the business is back up and running and making money and that's how they like it. And by the way, just just as a fun fact, really quick, businesses and I there's a reason why it's the color of money, but like businesses are way more likely to spend money on third-party services, professional services, hiring somebody like Barricade Cyber Solutions to come in and deal with an incident response than they are to invest internally in staff for these type of things. So if you're thinking, oh my gosh, we can't even hire someone to do this. Why would we? Why would they want to bring in a third party like this? It's actually more likely that that would happen, honestly. Now, I want to remind you, if you hold a professional certification such as CISP, CISA, CISM, any of them really, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE or continuing education credit. Uh, a lot of certifications require that you maintain some level of engagement uh, with professional development throughout the years uh, to maintain the quality and, um, you know, essentially the certification of the certification. Each episode of, first thing, of Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE. So that's two and a half a week, 10 a month roughly right so if you were here yesterday and today that's a full cpe i recommend you document literally the easiest and i would argue the most enjoyable way to earn cpes there's a lot of ways that can be brutal this is not one of them i assure all you have to do is say what's up in chat uh and you're you'll be you know burned into the record permanently as having been here so say what's up say you know where you're from say hashtag Team Live, whatever you want. And if you're watching on replay, thank you for being here on the replay. You make sure you say what's up in the chat or the comments too, simply so you can also gain those CPs. It doesn't matter if you're here live or not to get the CPEs. Uh, if you are here live, I love it. 84 of you on the Simply Cyber YouTube streams and many more coming from other platforms like Josh Mason's um, YouTube channels. I think Threat Gen's up in here. Obviously, LinkedIn, representing Twitch, Twitter, etc. Appreciate all of you. If you're on replay, drop hashtag team replay in chat. Uh, you definitely get credit and it is great to see. And I want to point out that I've got love for the team replay team. Okay. I, you know, team live gets a lot of love, but team replay, you know, they're people too. <laughs> Uh, we've been raffling off World of Haiku licenses last week and this week, and I set it up for team replay people to be able to uh, engage. Now, I posted it on the Discord server, so if you're not on Discord, you're missing out. SimplyCyber.io slash Discord or exclamation Discord in chat and um, Nightbot will take care of you. But uh, there is a giveaway channel in the Simply Cyber Discord server. And I see only 19 people have entered right now. So if you are interested in entering the World of Haiku license raffle for today, you need to go to the Discord server and enter. Um, why is, hold on. Why does it say the world, of, it's done? Yeah, 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 yeah. So in 33 minutes, the World of Haiku license key giveaway will be automatically picked by my bots. So if you want to enter... Uh, go ahead and do enter now. I see three people have entered. Uh, chat, if, if someone's trying to figure out how to get in the Discord, please help them. Uh, and I'll be doing this for the next couple days. So if you're watching this on replay now and you're like, oh, I didn't know that you did this yesterday for today, just know I'll do it tomorrow and the next day as well. 
kind of like World of Haiku week up in here, especially with our guest on Thursday, CEO of World of Haiku, Eric Basu, Navy CEO, cool dude. Um, we're going to bring him on. But anyways, let's let's finish the intro, right? Obviously, I just want people to be able to enter that World of Haiku. Um, obviously, if you are watching on replay, please be sure to go uh, enter the giveaway contests for the rest of the week. I, I want to show some love and support for you all. Uh, and if you are watching our replay, you can jump to the future and get right into the news story. But for the next 90 seconds or so, I am going to take a slug off this coffee. I, I just pressed the French press. I haven't had a sip of coffee yet, uh, which is this is me all natural. <laughs> so um, you know how we're rolling. But I'm going to say good morning to people. Have a couple of sips of coffee and then we're going to get right into it. So feel free to jump ahead about a minute and a half. If you're in the future, otherwise, good morning to you all. Hey, Michael Nation, good to see you. You got that system. Make sure you're capturing these CPEs to maintain that ISAC assert. Dan Reardon on LinkedIn. Ryan Spishock, always in chat. Victoria, what's up? No, no, no. You don't enter by entering Haiku in chat. You have to go to the giveaway channel in Discord. It's under the Simply Cyber category, and you have to hit the emote of like the little celebration icon thing. I can't really show you um, because I can't bring Discord up right now, but trust me. Yes, B. Cole, French press is the best. It's French roast on French press. Um, it's good. Sasha, what did Sasha get? I see Kimberly saying what's up and congratulations. Oh, good. Hey, Jay Smith, Kayla Rose, good to see you. Let me have this coffee, guys. Uh, guys, I, I don't want to jinx it. My wife always gets <laughs> frustrated when I call like, oh, hey, you know, it's surprisingly no traffic today. Uh, and then we immediately get run into gridlock. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it, but I am going to say I'm very, very happy with how the audio has been the last couple days. It's almost like my audio problems took a vacation. So what's up, Philip Martin? Good to see you. Hey, Lupe. Always, always great to see you in live chat. Oh yeah. Certifications. I love it. Way to go, Sasha. Matt McDaniel with the Death Wish coffee. Uh, Victoria, it is on the giveaway channel under the Simply Cyber banner, banner, right? So go under where it's it's like two below where vi videos and live streams are if you're on the SC Notify group. Good morning, Joshua B. Hey, Carrie. David B. in the house. Matthew Lattice. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed Matthew. Uh, World of Haiku. I've been playing it on stream all week and or last week. It's good. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Josh Mason's mocking me or not, but this is uh, this is good. I really got to take a cup, sip of this coffee. Ooh, Will Reed with the PCI. Nicely done, man. That's one area that I wish I knew more about, but I just have never had to really. I did a little bit at the Academic Medical Center, but we had a PCI guy, so it was always easy to just throw it over to him. Mm. Good grief, that's wicked hot. Hey, cause milk. All right, guys, let's get into it. I had my sip of coffee. I feel like I'm wasting you guys' precious time and I do respect it and want to honor it. All right, let's get into it. Guys, sit back, relax, and let's get the top news of the day. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. Akamai disrupts record DDoS in Europe. The CDN provider reports it thwarted the largest ever DDoS attack on the continent. The attack lasted 30 days, peaking on July 21st with peaks of 853.7 gigabits per second over a 14-hour period. The attack targeted an unnamed Akamai customer in Eastern Europe and used UDP as the vector rather than HTTPS-based. Based on the analysis of the attack, Akamai believes it used a highly sophisticated global botnet of compromised devices to orchestrate this campaign. Back in April, Kaspersky reported that DDoS attacks hit a record in Q1, up 46% on Q4. Wow. Australia. Okay. 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 So check it out. Um, this is interesting. A couple things to note here. Um, and if you haven't been around, like, you know, the industry for a while, you may not have context to this. First off, this, uh, um, this, this attack, distributed denial. First of all, like, let's level set for everybody, okay? Denial of service attack is basically where you um, attack the availability security objective of a system, right? And typically you can do it through just pushing so much data at a IP address because IP addresses are publicly routable, right? Nothing stops anyone from sending uh, data to a IP address. 
and you overwhelm it by basically filling the pipe, the network pipe, uh, with all sorts of crap data. So legitimate data, legitimate requests can't get in. Now, denial of service has been around forever, but as systems have gotten better, as network service providers have gotten better, <clears throat> regular denial of service from like one endpoint isn't going to cut it anymore. So, you, you know, bad guys have come up with distributed denial of service attacks. Now, this is basically where you have a ton of compromised hosts. Same concept as denial of service where like my machine and Josh Mason's Nest thermostat are all compromised and they're commanded to push data to a certain IP address. So obviously when you amplify it and you have more endpoints compromise pushing attacks, you get two things if you're a bad guy. One, you get way more data coming in, which is fantastic, right? Because you can really overwhelm a uh, resource. And then two, it becomes more difficult from a defensive perspective because you can't just block an IP address because it's it's pushing tons of data, right? That used to be, that used to be an easy way, like, oh, I'll just shut off this IP. But the problem is with 500 million IPs or whatever it was coming at you, 5 million, um, it's really difficult to say where uh, legitimate traffic is and where Ill illegitimate traffic is. Now, here's the other thing. Denial of service attacks are only wicked effective as long as they're kept up, right? As long as you have that fire um, hydrant open and the water's blasting out, then you can't get to where you're going. But you have to hold the hose open, right? And that's usually the thing. In my opinion, denial of service attacks typically last you know, maybe a couple days, typically like less than a day, right? Uh, this one was 30 days, which is uh, really unusual. I have not heard of one lasting as long as that. And by the way, not being talked about until afterwards. Usually like when denial of service attacks, it's very public. You know, Xbox, PlayStation Live Network goes down on Christmas 2000. 14 and lizard squad lizard squads like oh it's us we, we, you know like it's very very public very very obvious now the other thing that's interesting here is that they used a variety in the story they said udp attack guys really quick i know that this quick uh protocol thing's coming around and i don't know much about that but for most part at the transport layer there's tcp and udp and tcp is connection full and udp is connectionless it doesn't care it just sends the data which makes it a little bit more hard in order to prevent it because much like the fire hydrant example i just gave udp is just sending it's not waiting to hear back and it, it becomes in my opinion a little bit more difficult to kind of stop unless you just block udp but the story actually went and said that it was doing icmp reset floods which is a tcp sin floods which is tcp flag tcp anomaly tcp so all these tcp things fin push that's a tcp flag so it was a variety of things Obviously, it said a use in Eastern European target right there, Eastern European business. Uh, if I had to guess, uh, gun to my head, I would imagine that this has something to do with uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war. Maybe some business decided to come out and openly support one side or the other, and then the other side's group um, did not like that and basically blew them up for 30 days. So interesting case study. Um, this might be one worth um, bookmarking just, just for the mere fact that I have not heard of one lasting 30 days. I mean, that is a month. <clears throat> Can you imagine, guys, if you could knock an online business off for a month, like how devastating that would be? Like, think of like, um, I mean, Amazon would never go down like that, but I, I don't know. It's just, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. But anyways, interesting. Ak 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 Akamai was able to stop the DDoS attack that had lasted 30 days. That would be an interesting follow-up story. How did Akamai do it? Cloudflare is well known for stopping denial of service attacks too. Um, really interesting to see how they do that in the modern DDoS um, landscape of attacks, right? A man faces spyware charges. An unnamed 24-year-old Australian man was arrested by the Australian Federal Police and charged with six counts related to the creation of the imminent monitor remote access Trojan. The individual allegedly created the rat when he was 15, ultimately selling it to over 14,500 individuals across 128 countries. The tool could commonly be found on hacking forums for about $25, letting customers log keystrokes or turn on webcams and microphones. It's estimated to have generated up to $400,000 in revenue through 2019, when it was taken down with a coordinated global law enforcement operation called Operation Cepheus.
All right. <clears throat> so, you know, <clears throat> a couple things that jump out to me on this story. One, you know, threat actors don't have to be, you know, <laughs> Chinese or North Korean or Russian or Iranian, right? Five Eyes people, you know, the, like they can create malware too and they can sell it. And this Australian bird, you know, it sounds like he was a kid. Uh, wrote some software. Here's another thing. You don't have to have 25 years and a computer science degree to write um, effective malware, right? I mean, this kid's 15. He was, now he's 24. Uh, obviously, the pricing model, he sold it for $25. This thing was everywhere. I'm not familiar with this particular name, Imminent Threat um, Rat. Where is it? Imminent Monitor, excuse me. Imminent Monitor. But it sounds like it was a very cheap, very effective piece of spyware. Um, you know, everywhere. I'm, I guess what I would say is I'm very happy law enforcement. First of all, I'm super pumped that I get to use my KRS-One sound effect. Secondly, uh, it's just good to see these stories where, um, you know, people are being held accountable, brought to justice, um, you know, to help hopefully thwart and deter individuals from pursuing a life of cybercrime. Um, so this is interesting. I guess the only thing I would look into is maybe if there if there was any kind of uh, indicators of compromise associated with this imminent monitor malware. Chances are, you know, it's not like surging. It said fourteen thousand five hundred endpoints. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's not a ton of uh, compromises. Oh, oh, it's used by fourteen thousand. Excuse me. So. I don't know. I, this is an interesting story to me. I'm not going to take action on it, but if you wanted to, you could look up what the indicators of compromise are for this particular piece of malware. Obviously, law enforcement's done their research, so they'll be able to tell you maybe what C2 infrastructure the rat uh, speaks back to. With this kid going to jail, it's possible It's possible the C2 infrastructure is going to be torn down or it's already been torn down by law enforcement. So it may not even be an issue uh, anymore. Meta accused of failing to tackle hate speech in Kenya. Last week, Kenya's National Cohesion and Integration Commission accused Meta's Facebook platform of failing to properly handle hate speech and incitement on its platform ahead of the country's August 9th elections. The NCIC said it was consulting with the Communications Authority of Kenya to recommend suspending Facebook. While government officials have been critical of haphazard decisions with content moderation on the platform, several have vowed that the platform will not be shut down in the country as a result. Several experts have blamed this content on a lack of training for Kenya-specific content for Facebook's AI moderation tools and a lack of human moderators with local context. Okay, so this is a um, really interesting story, okay? I have a lot uh, of meat on this bone, okay? So first off, you might be like, you know, you might look at this and be like, okay, so it seems pretty cut and dry, Jerry. People are like putting hate speech on social media. Social media platforms not doing anything about it. Uh, that's terrible. They're terrible. You know, big faceless capitalism, right? But let's let's unpack this for a second, okay? I didn't see the tweets or the social media posts, right? So maybe they are truly just vile, hate, inflammatory, disgusting, not adding to any of the like, you know, uh, discourse in any kind of, a constructive way okay so let's just let's just say that that's the case okay i want to point out though that a couple things one um yes meta does have kind of a, a social obligation in order to keep those social medias clean but who is deciding what is considered inappropriate or inflammatory right i mean i can give you an example of a hate speech tweet or whatever that's obviously, obviously 99 out of 99 people will all agree that that is inappropriate, but it's the major gray area in between where a lot of these things fall and who gets to decide is an algorithm that Facebook made get to decide whether or not if I say like, oh, I don't agree with this person's politics because of X, Y, and Z, right? They're, like their decision led to um, you know, the, the death of 10,000 people, right? Because of like, you know, um, a decision that somebody made. Okay. Well, is that inflammatory? Obviously it's going to get some people all fired up, right? So who gets to decide 
Now does it turn into one where it's like whoever the ruling party is or whoever has the deepest pockets and has paid into um, or has received financial uh, donations for political campaigns from Facebook? Do you, do you see what I'm saying, how this can quickly turn into a, a problem where it's who's, who's controlling the levers in the background and whose money is behind the person controlling the levers in the background, right? So there's that. Also, I want to point out, uh, because I did really enjoy this, on Netflix, there is a documentary called The the Big Hack, I think. It's either The Big Hack or The Great Hack. Uh, somebody fact check me in chat. I think, it's, I think it's The Big Hack. No, no, no. It's The Great Hack. The Big Hack was that Bloomberg story about Supermicro. The Great Hack. And essentially what they're talking about is how Cambridge Analytica got involved in the 2016 U.S. presidential election and influenced you know, individuals and, and, and potentially influence the outcome of the election. But if you watch the documentary, many of us know about the 2016 election and the meddling and all that stuff. But if you watch the documentary, they actually talk about, well, we started in Trinidad, Tobago in a smaller kind of election situation and controlled that one. And they explain how they control that. Then we moved into the UK with Brexit and we cho and we influenced Brexit. And we influenced it in a direction that aligned with who was paying our bills. You see what I'm saying? And then they moved up. So, I mean, if people in the UK right now are like, why the hell did Brexit happen? You may want to watch The Great Hack because it's really, really interesting what happened. So, all of that is to say, this is like Hot Take Central. Mercy! This is Hot Take Central. But, I mean, when I saw this, I'm like, huh, that's interesting. I wonder if a... Cambridge Analytica 2.0 has come up and they're they're cutting their teeth on their new algorithms in smaller, you know, less, uh, I guess, on national stage type countries. Just a theory, just an idea. But I, I all I want to say is, again, this could be cut and dry and it could just be nasty, nasty, vile hate speech. But, you know, taking a moment and thinking about it, it, you know, it could be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more gray. Indonesia blocks sites not complying with registration rules. Indonesia's communications ministry announced it blocked access to Yahoo, PayPal, and several gaming sites, including Steam and Epic Games, citing failure to properly register with authorities. Under these new rules, companies must register with the regulator, which has the authority to compel platforms to disclose user data and take down unlawful content within 24 hours. These rules were announced back in November 2020, and companies had to come into compliance by last week. Reuters report that several companies scrambled to make the deadline, including Meta. Officials say the government may reopen access to PayPal for a short time to allow users to withdraw deposits and will unblock sites once properly registered. All right, so this okay, so this story here is underneath the, the hood here, okay? Yeah, a fatality sound would be good. I, I actually, I got this one too. Okay, so here's the deal. Indonesia wholesale blocking major um, major websites, right, and services. Yahoo, you know, I don't really know what Yahoo provides other than, you know, kind of like a, a fifth-rate <laughs> search engine. Um, I don't, you know, whatever. I don't, I haven't been to Yahoo since, um, you know, I, well, what, what do I, I'm trying to think of some, like, fine, kind of silly metaphor. Um, I, I don't have one. I don't have one, but I, I, I yeah, I haven't been to Yahoo in, in a decade or more. Okay. But PayPal, that's a service for, you know, goods and services, paying for stuff, gaming websites, et cetera. They talked about meta being caught up in this. So here's the deal. The government of a country decides what is appropriate, right? Yeah. Fantasy sports. That's right. So a government website, a government determines what can, can and cannot happen using regulation. And then, you know what? Good for Indonesia. They actually put changes in place, technical changes at the kind of national ISP level to enforce those decision-making processes, right? Now, this is cool. Now, to me, the story under the story, all of these businesses are going to do a cash benefit or um, is it cash benefit analysis? Oh my God. I'm like dumb this morning. It's a... Um, Cash benefit? In that doesn't sound right. Basically, they're going to do a, an analysis of, is it worth spending the money to get in line with whatever this regulation is on uh, it, 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 to continue doing business? Or is it cost more money to, to get compliant than it is to the money that comes in from the business? My, my brain hit. My brain hurt. Cost benefit analysis. Jesus. I knew it was C. 
and I cash did not sound right. Um, anyways, cash benefit. Yeah. Throwing dice. So anyways, the story under the story, if I will, if you, if you allow me for a second, if you work in corporate America, or if you're an aspiring student and you're going to be going into corporate America or you're, um, you know, in the trades, right? Maybe you're a truck driver, Aaron, I see you. Maybe you're, maybe you're in the trades and you're going to pivot into cyber. Here's the reality of corporate. And this is so on the nose. The Indonesia passed these laws in 2020. It's 20, it's mid, it's almost the Q3, August, 2022, or it is Q3, August, 2022, right? We're almost in 2023. And these large players, Meta, Yahoo, PayPal, these are household names, scrambled to meet compliance. This is classic. Dude, they could have gave them four years. And guess what would have happened? In August 2024, they would have scrambled. They could have made it in place in, you know, whatever, May 2021. They would have scrambled, but they would have made it. It's just, it's hilarious. Like, it's basically classic PM stuff, dude. Like anytime you set a deadline in the future, you will work proportion. Like the proportion of how hard you're working is is correlated to how close you are to the deadline. And you know I'm right. You're in chat talking to yourself, going, "Oh yeah, that's so true. That's so true." Just kicking it down the curve until it's like, "Holy crap! Holy crap! What is this talking about? We got blocked in Indonesia. Damn it! It's so true." So lo long story short, make sure you set deadlines, but set micro incremental milestone deadlines and hit those and get freaked out when you start passing those things instead of waiting for the uh yeah work expands to fill time that's so true Stefan. and now thanks to this week's episode sponsor highest all right let's get our cyber criminals try their hardest sponsors to cover on. their tracks but no matter what they always leave a trail highest insight gives you access to all of the data you need to trace an attack back to its source this helps you map out the complete attack campaign infrastructure letting you proactively defend against future attacks and even potentially provide key data to law enforcement. Take your cybersecurity investigations further than you ever thought possible with Hyas Insight. Visit Hyas.com. That's H-Y-A-S dot com. All right. So thank you to CISO Series for um, continuing to deliver great podcasts that we can piggyback on top of. I do want to take a minute and thank the uh, partners that have worked been working with or work with simply cyber or internal simply cyber projects that we're working on guys i want to tell you right now all week i've been raffling off license keys for world of haiku this is a very cool cyber security kind of near-term cyberpunk uh vibe of world you go in and the whole point is yes it's a game yes there's a storyline yes it's fun but you will learn it will teach you basic linux uh, commands, right? So like your LS, your PWD, your CD, curl, IP conf or IF config, right? You learn basic Linux commands. You basically learn how to navigate around a Linux box. You learn a little bit of how network networks are shaped, right? It doesn't teach you the OSI stack, but it does teach you like, oh, you can jump from this box to this box, right? SSH. Very fun game. You also learn some pen testing skills in the game, right? It's on Steam. We're going to be licensing off a raffle key. You need to go to the Discord server. Nightbot just dropped the link. Thank you, Mods, for drop for uh, bringing it up. Go to the Discord server. Join. It's very, very simple, very, very easy. You should probably join the Discord server if you're not there already because it's all about good times in there. On the left nav, scroll down through the different channels. There is one that says giveaway. It's under a large category called Simply Cyber, just like this channel. Go in there, scroll to the bottom. There's a little celebration emote and you just click it. That's it. And I know that that was like a popsicle headache of directions, but basically join the Discord server, go to the giveaway channel and click on an emote. That's the TLDR. I will, do, I will be doing it this way all week because I want Team Replay to get some love too. This will auto draw in eight minutes. So stay tuned. I will um, I will stop the chat and we will talk about who our winner is and let everybody know uh, what's up. All right, good job, Carrie. All right, so I just wanted to share everyone that. Also, I want to tell everyone, and this is completely optional, but it's pretty cool, okay? I don't control when uh, sales go on. <clears throat> in the merch store 
because it's 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 controlled by the back end platform that hosts all that stuff. But between now and August 7th, everything at the Simply Cyber merch store or whatever is 20% off. It's 20% off everything and anything, right? Again, I can't control when these when these sales happen, but I can make you aware of them. So if you're been wanting to get the Simply Cyber shirt or Team Replay hoodie or hat or whatever, whatever it is you guys want, um, it's 20% off for the next five, six days. Maybe you get swagged out for um, Black Hat DEF CON or just whatever. So you can do exclamation point merch. And, and I think Nightbot will take you there, but it's basically simplycyber.io. And on the top right is the merch button. So if you're interested, again, um, no pressure, not really pushing that, but I wanted to make you aware because it's a cool deal. It's it's the best deal that they offer. They do 20%, 15% and free shipping. And it kind of just rotates and shows up. All right, let's keep rolling people. Researchers discover apps leaking Twitter keys. A new report from security researchers at CloudSec documents 3,207 apps that leak legitimate consumer key and consumer secret information. Of these, 230 apps leaked all four authentication credentials needed for a full Twitter account takeover. The concern is that these leaked credentials could be automatically harvested by a malware operation to enroll impacted accounts into a larger coordinated bot army. While not the subject of this report, the researchers also noted that other apps in the past have been found to leak secret keys for GitHub, AWS, HubSpot, and RazorPay accounts. CloudSec recommends organizations review code for directly hard-coded API keys and periodically rotate keys to help reduce the blast radius incurred by a leak. Okay, so, I mean, this is true. Really quick, um, API keys, if you don't know, like, when you go to Twitter, right, if you're if you're on a, a web browser, right, and you go to Twitter and you type in like "Simply Cyber is awesome," tweet, right? You're posting a tweet through the web app, and it seems like normal, but you can do it on a mobile app. You can write a script that you know this kid who wrote the script that basically every time Elon Musk's took uh, plane took off, it would pull the coordinates, it would get notified, and then it would post to Twitter. He wasn't waiting to get a, a text message and then he quickly ran to the web app and typed it in. He wrote script that did it automatically. And this is how APIs work and why we use them. It's an application programming interface and it basically allows you to interface with the back end of a system. So the web app that you log into and you type your little tweet or whatever, that's essentially their application using their API to talk to the back end. So anyone can use the API and a lot of you know, businesses will make the API publicly available so people can develop their custom code, custom scripts, custom apps, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, when I post to Twitter using an API key, it needs to post to Jerry's or Simply Cyber's Twitter account. It doesn't post to Josh Mason's or, or Jack Scott's, right? Or I'll post Gray. It doesn't. And it's because the API key is unique to me. Now, I don't want anyone else to post to Twitter using my API key. So the API key is secret, right? And this is the this is the gist of confidentiality and control over who's allowed to post to certain things and using these API keys. Now, this is the story and I find this not surprising because there's a lot of hacks out there including myself who just hack code together to make it do something and make it work, right? First to market is the is the term where like you come up with a cool idea and you get it to market first because you have first mover advantage because no one else is doing it and people buy your product spend five bucks an app or whatever and you become an overnight millionaire well if you wait to do it securely and go through levels of code review and analysis and crap like that maybe you're not first to market and you lose that first market mover advantage which means that why would i buy your app i've already spent five dollars and sunk cost into the first movers app right now you get into a such a situation where you need to be able to like have key differentiators and all this other stuff. So anyways, long story short, businesses will move first market wicked fast because it's important and a lot of times security fails there. Now, the apps will work the way they're supposed to because the API keys, but this study is showing that literally 3,200 or nearly 3,200 apps are leaking their keys, meaning that they were not properly written that means that people can pull their keys. Maybe it's, like they said, open source repos, like GitHub repos behind the apps and stuff like that. And 
yes, if you stumble across them, that's not good. But as they point out, threat actors might develop their own kind of harvesting scripts to go through and look for these keys because the keys do have kind of a, um, a, a structure, right? That you would be looking for either maybe a variable name of Twitter API or maybe the Twitter API keys have a certain length, right? You can use regular expressions to start looking for these things and pull them out. And then, you know, you basically automate it and harvest it. And now you've got tons of API keys that you can exploit for whatever nefarious purposes you want. Maybe you want to do a misinformation campaign. Maybe you want to amplify some type of message, right? We saw threat actors last year get into Twitter. And now this is a way more sophisticated attack than stolen API keys. But we saw threat actors steal... Um, access to powerful blue checkmark Twitter accounts, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, a couple other ones, and tweet out about like, oh, here, if you send money to this Bitcoin wallet, I'll send you double back, right? And those threat actors made a lot of money off of a lot of victims. But now let's take it and have, let's say, 10,000 compromised Twitter accounts, like not blue checkmarks, just, you know, random Joe 389 and, you know, whatever, Teddy's girl, 217 and, and beach ball lover, right? Like whatever. And they're, they're chiming on top of it. Yes, I did this. I just got double Bitcoin back from Elon. Wow. Thanks, Elon. Like going to buy myself a Bugatti, like whatever. You can see how, like, just as a simple example, how you can use those weaponized accounts in order to push a narrative uh, on social media or get something trending, right? So they suggest in the story, don't hard code API keys, best practice. They also said rotate API keys. Guys, I got to tell you right now, the reason that like rotating API keys and really at the bigger picture, like managing PKI infrastructure, which is a, which I know is the I stands for infrastructure, but just bear with me chat, right? PKI infrastructure. The reason it's tough to maintain these things, it's easy to set up. Lots of people can set crap up managing it, maintaining it, keeping it healthy, keeping it up and running, keeping it on the rails, greasing it, keeping, you know, just overall operations and maintenance of these type of things can be unwieldy, just like account reviews. People don't do that with any regularity and you end up with like 50 domain accounts, right? Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Justin Gold with the RuneScape ref. So you guys hear what I'm saying, right? Um, level Goddess... It's well, hold on. You'll have to I'll, I'll, one second. Hold on. Okay. So that's it for the API keys. Long story short, don't hard code and don't be surprised if you see a story about uh, API key leakage really quick. We just got the world of haiku winner selected um, in discord. The winner is night, Witch. night, Witch. I'm not sure who you are, but congratulations. 81 entrants into the chat. There's 173 plus probably 50. There's a cut over 200 people here and only 81 entered the, uh, the raffle. Uh, so night, Witch, please contact me for your license key. And remember everybody, I will be creating another giveaway just like this one after the stream today that will draw tomorrow morning at 8 40 AM. So be sure to enter. Okay. Especially team replay. I'm, I'm doing it this way. So Team Replay has a, has a fighter's chance, right? A puncher's chance. Data brokers sell access to profiles of actively pregnant users. An investigative Gizmodo found 32 different data brokers across the U.S. selling access to unique mobile IDs for two profiles of people labeled as either actively pregnant or shopping for maternity products, with another data set of 478 million profiles labeled interested in pregnancy. It's unclear how many of these data sets overlap. Pricing for access to these profiles is based on customers reached by an ad, ranging from $0.49 cents per user to $2.25. Some datasets were collected from people who shared data through registering for promotional sites, while others were collected based on internal data analysis to correlate purchase activity with these categories. Brokers obtained data through relationships with payment processors, through outright ownership of coupon sites, or through ad network partnerships with retailers. Okay. This... This story, okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. I will do my best not to flip out. Um, and I know that this seems like kind of like, oh, that's an interesting story. Whatever. Okay, here's the deal. First of all, John Oliver last week tonight has an episode called Data Brokers. 
strongly encourage you check it out. If you, okay, so if you are like very interested in privacy, check out the data brokers. If you are of the mindset that if you have this particular philosophical worldview, such as I don't have anything to hide. I don't see why you're so concerned with privacy. What are you hiding? If that's your worldview, check the John Oliver last week tonight data brokers, okay? It's not about hiding something. It's about privacy. Now, these particular ones um, are quite interesting. You go to the store, you use your little Vic card or your Harris Teeter card or whatever, and you get like whatever, eight cents off a loaf of bread and you know three for four uh, ears of corn, whatever. That's all tracking what you're doing, right? Where you're going online is tracking what apps you have installed, how long you look at something, you sign up for coupon codes, whatever. You just buy something, okay? On, and with your credit card, and the credit card company sells that data, I'm sure. What's the problem? Well, here's the problem. Couple of things. First, let's talk about the psychological impact, right? You are in your second trimester and you lose the baby, right? Um, and, you know, this is a straw man argument. So, you know, no one actually lost the baby, but that would be devastating. Devastating. And then Pampers sends you, you know, 50 diapers and congratulates you on your new edition. That's emotionally jarring, right? Here's another one. Let's say you're 16 years old and you live at home or you're 15. And you've been sexually assaulted. Or you're just 15 and you're you you, you, you know, you're into having sex, whatever. So you get pregnant and you, you bought a pregnancy test, right? And you find out you got pregnant and you're 15. You're scared. You don't know what to do. And something gets mailed to your house basically telling your parents that you're pregnant. How's that feel? Or, or whoever your caregiver is, right? Maybe you get thrown out of the house because you come from like an ultra um, strict household, right? Now, what are you going to do? Like, and it wasn't your choice. You didn't get to decide how the information was disclosed. Capitalism decided how the information got disclosed. Those are just two scenarios. Now let's take it down a dark path. Roe versus Wade just got overturned at the Supreme Court level. States are enacting their own rules and legislations around abortion. Well, you find out you're pregnant, right? Guess who else just found out you're pregnant? Anyone who spent the $2.25 for a data set that included you in it. Now, it doesn't say definitively Jerry's pregnant. But based on all these, you know, data points that are completely um, uh, seem unrelated to each other, but <clears throat> they correlate and they map up and everything. High probability, high confidence that, you know, Jerry's pregnant, right? I'm, I'm saying me that way. I don't call anyone specifically. I know it's a silly example, okay? Now, now I know that Jerry's pregnant. So, and like, I'm going to target them, right? Like, oh, like you think, I know you're 14 and you got sexually assaulted by a criminal or whatever, but we're going to like accost you about wanting to get an abortion or we're going to start pushing tons and tons of, of Planned Parenthood, uh, not Planned Parenthood, like um, uh, like anti-abortion propaganda to your house, signing you up for stuff, doing all sorts of stuff, right? Or, or the opposite, harassing you for being, um, um, you know, what's the word? Um, oh my God. They're like being sexually active, right? Like judging you and causing problems uh, around that, right? So it it could get it can get bad guys okay and this is all because you bought a pregnancy test right you did not opt in to all of this other crap i just talked about but because of the way data is and the way data is sold and the tracking of it all th this can happen right so be mindful of that um and and again i'm telling you man data brokers watch that <laughs> watch that john oliver you will be stunned at the amount of data out there how it's for sale how it's being weaponized both in a nefarious way and in a capitalistic way. Happy, happy Tuesday. Samsung launches repair mode. The company introduced a new repair mode for its Galaxy S21 smartphone line in South Korea under the battery and device care settings. Once activated, this will hide personal information, photos, messages, and linked accounts, only making pre-installed apps visible to repair technicians.
It's unclear how this hiding of content and settings works, whether it saves the state of the device in an encrypted partition and replaces it with a stock image, potentially making it a security measure, or if this information is simply hidden from view of a technician. The company plans to roll repair mode out to other models going forward, although it's unclear if this will come to other markets. This and is cool. This, I mean, this is a cool idea, okay? This is a cool idea. Um, I like this. I, I've seen actually luxury cars uh, have a similar feature called valet mode. So like if you're going to get your car valeted, so you're basically going to allow someone to drive your car that isn't you, um, you can enable valet mode. And I think, I think that they can't go over a certain speed limit and they can't drive from like, you know, they can't drive more than 10 miles, right? Because I mean, where the hell are they going to park it? It's, they're not driving two towns over to park your car. So something along those lines. Um, and it locks like the glove box and stuff like that. So anyways, the idea behind this is clever, right? People do a lot on their phone nowadays. They take pics that they may not want to share publicly, right? Uh, and I'm not talking about nudes, chat, you filthy, you filthy uh, minds. I meant like you're taking pictures of your passwords and your API keys, obviously, right? Um, you got your contacts in there, uh, text message. Uh, maybe you've got bank account information, all this other stuff that you, you really, the phone is a very personal item now. It's uh, like, I, I tell people all the time between losing my phone and my wallet, I would lose my wallet a hundred out of a hundred times. Like every time my phone is way too valuable, both from a productivity perspective, from an engagement and communication perspective, from a life-saving perspective. <laughs> so, um, the repair mode is very cool. It basically locks down uh, the device in such a way that technicians really can operate on it the way they need to, get into the operating system, maybe replace the screen, et cetera, without um, allowing them to peruse your device, right? So maybe maybe they find you attractive and they're like, oh, I'm gonna steal some photos or I'm gonna take their, um, you know, the, get their home address out of the contact list, right? Some creepy stuff could go on very easily. Right. And all you wanted to do was apply the most recent patch because you watched the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing and Jerry said, make sure you apply your patches because all these Android apps are full of malware. Right. So you're just trying to do a good thing. And then you got some creep technician who's up in your privates. So love the repair mode. Again, they didn't really understand how it worked. So whether it encrypts to a, 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 um, a file share, my, my thinking is it probably. If I had to guess, the file system is probably accessible underneath and it probably just makes it so only certain areas of the phone uh, can be brought up to the front, right? But if you stuck in, you know, um, an OMG cable or, you know, some type of dongle to pull down or mount the phone as a file share, then you would definitely be able to get into it. I would suspect. Um, so that's just a theory. Fun fact, side note. Uh, as far as life-saving device goes, uh, <laughs> I mean, it really is a lifesaver. I, I went running uh, in the woods not too long ago and got lost, uh, which is kind of embarrassing, but got lost and ended up having to use the GPS in order to uh, navigate my way out of the woods because it was getting dark. It was uh, very, um, very rugged terrain. So life-saving device. Way to go, phones. Way to go, Samsung. I hope this actually becomes more of a standard. Although Apple doesn't want you to do repairs on your phone. They only want you to do it at certified Apple dealerships. And only Apple hires great people, right? So there's no way that they need a repair mode because they're not going to hire someone who's um, diabolical, which is not true, obviously. Patch Tuesday update. Researchers at Nozomi Networks discovered a flaw in Dahua IP cameras that could let attackers seize control of them through open network video interface forum authentication. Dahua patched the flaw on June 29th. And the GNU project patched the GNU TLS cryptographic library to fix a memory mismanagement error that could allow for malicious code to gain access to a double assigned memory block. Thanks for listening to today's cybersecurity. Oh, the old double assigned memory block. <laughs> I mean, you don't really see that abuse too often, but I will tell you, um, this right here, IP that allows attackers to seize control. Yep. I mean, that's pretty much. You know, this was like so rampant and so cur uh, common a few years ago that like 
it wouldn't even be newsworthy. It wouldn't even make it into the daily cyber threat briefing. I haven't really seen one in a while, but yeah, I mean, guys, real quick, this is why you should have um, some type of, you know, if you have a vulnerability scanner on your network, you should be looking for shadow IT, right? It's not uncommon for good, you know, well-intentioned uh, Carl to shove an IP camera or a, like a switch or a router or something on your network uh, in the name of productivity, right? Like Carl doesn't want to go down to the loading dock every single hour to look to see if a truck has arrived. Carl just installs an IP camera. Now Carl can just look at his desk. No one's here and go back to playing Yahoo Spades. No one's here. Go back to watching World Cup soccer, right? Someone's here. Time to go. So that's wicked easy and, and, and more productivity for Carl. But now you've got shadow IT, which could be compromised, which could lead to um, not a, a bastion, but a, um, a, a beachhead on your network. And guys, ask any red teamer. They love themselves some beachheads. They love punching a hole into the side of the hull, kind of opening the metal up and then fusing that compromised endpoint right there and then using it as a pivot point into the network, right? So that's why we don't like shadow IT. So long story short, make sure, here's the thing, make sure you patch the Dahu IP camera, but in reality, how about you remove the IP camera from your network or you get one that is, or, or you start maintaining it actively, right? Guys, there's no reason you can't have this camera on your network. I'm not saying shadow IT is, 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 I mean, shadow IT is a bad thing, but you can have these IP cameras on your network. They just need to be part of your asset inventory, part of your hardware inventory, part of your overrise, overall enterprise ecosystem build. This thing now requires maintenance, upkeep, patching, um, making sure access to it is controlled, making sure that only certain IPs can address it, making sure that when it goes into life, it gets replaced. And oh, by the way, six months before budgeted for, you can't just leave these things lingering, which is why sprawl is such a problem. It's easy to go on Amazon and click, 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 and buy a bunch of crap, come throw it on your network and be like, look at what I did. I'm awesome. I'm innovative. Look at all these solutions that I got on, on the cheap. Yeah, that's awesome. What about all the manpower, FTE, right? All the, all the person power, manpower, woman power, all the human capital that we now need to invest to maintain this wicked innovative solution, right? You just spent a dime to save a nickel, Carl. Seriously. Okay. That was more of a, <laughs> that was more of a shadow IT flip out than it was about Dahu IP cameras, but just be mindful. Okay, guys, this, this happens all the time. And the cases I'm making is how you should be making them to IT. Like if you just go to, all right, I'm really losing it now. Listen, if you just say no, if you're the office of no, if you say, hey, you can't put that IP camera here because that isn't going to fly. You might be able to get some, you might be able to get it to work, but you're losing political capital. You need everybody rowing the boat in the same direction. I mean, yeah, you can just like slap one of the boat rowers and be like row in the right direction and maybe they will maybe they won't but i guarantee you you're not going to be winning the hearts and minds you it's it's like the stick of the carrot right if you help them understand which is why i push on security awareness so heavily if you help people understand why we're doing a certain thing and what the negative consequences are of not doing it or having shadow it people get on board most people are well-intentioned most people want to do the right thing and you're enabling them to understand why the right thing is what it is, right? In the absence of information, people will make their own risk-based decisions, right? It's a fact. The person who puts the camera, IP camera, the Carl, they're making the risk-based decision. What's the big deal? It's an IP camera. How is this a problem? It's not. I'm the only one who knows it's here. Carl doesn't know that threat actors can scan the internet. They can use Shodan. This IP camera is misconfigured. This IP camera reaches back to some, you know, Dahu C2 server, which is not really called C2, but like some backend, uh, you know, maintenance server or something like that. They don't have the information, so they make the decision. It's not a big deal. I bought it on Amazon. Amazon Prime deals, right? I got it two for 15 bucks. It's a win. All right. Fancy!
All right, all right, all right. I'm losing my mind. All right, guys. I want to remind everyone, in case you didn't know, this Wednesday, so tomorrow at 11.30 a.m., we've got another hot banger, Threat Gen Red vs. Blue Live. I am going up against Matt Lee. You guys know him as Cyber Matt Lee. Works over at PAX 8. If you don't recognize him, you might recognize his beard. Uh, Matt's a wonderful individual, great, great cybersecurity professional, great community member. He and I have been, uh, you know, talking for a while, and we just thought it would be fun to go heads up. Uh, so we're going to be doing that. Uh, hopefully you can join us. I don't have the promo card available yet. I will have it later today. But this Thursday on Simply Cyber Live, the long-form 4.30 p.m. show, we will be having Eric Basu, the CEO of World of Haiku, on to talk about World of Haiku, where he's going with it, what you can expect, why they've chosen the way that they've chosen, how they're looking to disrupt the industry. Uh, it's going to be a really cool conversation. And this dude is a really, um, a really he's just a cool guy. I, I really enjoyed uh, having a conversation with him last week and super excited to have him come on. Uh, hopefully I can, I can shake him a little bit and have some license keys fall out of his pockets uh, on stream and we can raffle those off as well. Guys, I really appreciate all of you. I hope you had a good time. Remember, go to the Simply Cyber Discord server to enter the World of Haiku raffle for tomorrow's live stream daily threat briefing, okay? Tomorrow, Wednesday, August 3rd, the raffle for the license key will be happening, but you have to enter through Discord. Team Replay, best luck to you, Team Live. Really appreciate y'all being here today. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you got value. Hit the like if that's something that you're into. It only takes a second and it helps other people find it. That's always cool. Be good, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Tuesday and we will see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Goodbye.